I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the ones in the seats around you. Turn to page 1080 and you will find the first chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or don't have a Bible and you need, a, need one and want to read God's Word, then take one of these with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, it will change your life. Hey, while you're finding Acts chapter 1, uh, let me just uh, mention, for the last five weeks, we've been talking about our purpose, about living intentionally for Christ. And uh, we started with the question, what on earth am I here for? You know, what's my purpose? Why do I exist? And we've been talking about our purposes according to Scripture. Uh, that God created us to worship Him. That it is natural and right for us to be doing this, what we're doing, but it's not just an hour during the week, but it's a lifestyle of sacrificing ourselves to honor God. That, that we were created or formed for God's family. That we were made for community. That we're not supposed to do this journey following Jesus alone. That uh, we need each other, we need to be in groups, we need to be connected so that we can share a life and people can know us and we can know them. We also talked about that we were created to become like Jesus. In other words, God expects us to grow up, to be maturing, not just satisfied with where we are, but to always be developing in our faith so that we become more and more like Jesus day in and day out. And then, of course, last week we talked about how we are shaped for serving. That God not only created us and loved us, but he actually has gifted us and, and equipped us with experiences and talents to contribute to his kingdom and make a difference in this world. Today, we're talking about made for mission. Now, before we dive into uh, today's purpose, let me talk about next week for a moment. And I know Pastor Robert mentioned this uh, briefly, but I just want to tell you again, next weekend we're going to be celebrating what God has been doing in our lives and talking about what next. And so we got two requests for you. First of all, if you're here and you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you've never proclaimed that in baptism, we want to help you be obedient to Jesus. In fact, that's all we really exist to do here is just help you follow Jesus. And so if, uh, if you want to get baptized, let us know. Stop by and catch one of the pastors. Tell us your name. Uh, email the church office. Call the church office. Uh, we would love to celebrate that life change with you. Secondly, if God has really changed your life, especially in the last couple of weeks, last six weeks or so, we'd love to hear about it. I'd love to tell that story to the congregation as a whole. And so if you could just email me a paragraph saying, hey, here's what God's been teaching me, here's what God's been doing. If you don't want to email it, write it on a piece of paper, drop it in one of the offering boxes, put it in my hand. Uh, we would love to be able to share that next week. Uh, just the stories of God's life-changing power as it applies to your life. So today we're talking about mission. Because you actually were made for a mission. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Uh, now, Acts is the continuation of the Gospel of Luke, written by the same man. Uh, Luke was a physician and a historian, and so he collected the stories as he traveled with Paul and, and others about the, the Gospel of Luke. And then he continued chronicling the story of the early church. What happened when Jesus left the earth? So we pick up Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, that's Jesus and the disciples, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when Jesus had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now this is about 40 days after the resurrection. So 40 days. So they've, for 40 days, Jesus has been appearing to them. They've been hanging out with him. He's been teaching them. And now they are ready for Jesus to establish his kingdom right there in Israel and retake the throne in Jerusalem. And so the disciples said, Jesus, is it time? Are we going to conquer Rome? Are we going to take back the throne? Are we going to set up the kingdom? And Jesus said, that's not for you to know. That's really not your business. 
And I know, we always want to know about the future kingdom. We always want to know when it's going to happen, and we're ready for it. And Jesus says, you just got to wait until it gets here. It's going to be real, but it isn't time yet. Instead, Jesus says, I have a mission for you. I have a mission for you. And he says, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be my witnesses. And what that means for us is this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you were made for this mission. You were made for this mission. Which means that at this point, I need to kind of pause the sermon and, uh, and just issue a disclaimer and acknowledge the elephant in the room for some of us. Uh, if you were like me, uh, raised in an evangelical church, and by that I mean a church where on a regular basis, uh, you know, the messages were kind of hellfire and, and brimstone and uh, talked a lot about, you know, people need to uh, come to Christ right now and, and it's kind of turn or burn, get right or get left, repent, uh, that kind of thing. And, and you were always feeling like you had to share your faith. Uh, let me just see, how many of others of you are there in this room besides me like that? Okay, some of you didn't raise your hands and I know your stories and you're not, you're not telling the truth. So, <laughs> hey, there's, there's a bunch of us that were and a lot of us that weren't. So if you weren't raised in that kind of church, then just indulge us a little bit because we're going to do a little bit of therapy today. And, uh, and if you were raised in that kind of church, then, then I want to uh, you know, be able to address some of the, the feelings and thoughts that we had hearing that message over and over and over again because whenever they talked about mission growing up, there were two uh, feelings that kind of dominated the congregation, guilt and failure. Um, a lot of us felt guilty because we were supposed to be sharing Jesus, and we didn't. Okay, we were supposed to be sharing Jesus. We knew we were supposed to share Jesus, and, and we didn't do it. At least we didn't do it by the definition of the way that the preachers and, and evangelists were telling us that we were supposed to do it. Because we were supposed to share the whole plan of salvation and pray with people. We are supposed to put tracts in their hands and, you know, and stuff like that. And, and in, in, in 90% plus of church members of those kinds of churches didn't share their faith, not the way it was defined. And we also felt failure because when we tried, or at least for me, when I tried to share my faith, I failed. I wasn't very good at it, and I'm your pastor, and I'm telling you that. So, um, so here's what I've come to realize and understand. The problem wasn't with Jesus or the Bible or the mission, but how the church taught and explained and promoted that mission. And so what I want to do today, talking about this mission that Jesus has given us, is tell you what I think God wants us to grasp that will alter our lives and fill us with purpose as we embrace the mission of Jesus and are successful in it. In other words, every single one of us in this room, this applies to us if you're a follower of Christ. Now, here's how I understand this. First of all, most of us in this room want to obey Jesus. Okay, that's just where I'm starting out the point. You're here, you're in church, you're worshiping God, you're celebrating. I, I assume most of us in this room want to obey Jesus. And Jesus has a mission that he wants us to accomplish. And the power of God that took Jesus out of the tomb and started on the day of Pentecost is real today in exactly the same way. So Jesus wants us to be successful. We want to be obedient. So what does that look like for us if we're going to step into that obedience and see God work in our lives resulting in us fulfilling our purpose. So first of all, let's talk about our mission. Our mission here at Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. You may have noticed this before when you walked in the main lobby because we have it prominently displayed because we take it very seriously because this is Jesus' mission. Now, I know he didn't use those words. Those are kind of the way we've worded it here at Calvary. But think about it. Jesus said, you are to be my witnesses. In Matthew 28, in what's called the Great Commission, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. The Apostle Paul said, you know, proclaim the faith. Proclaim the gospel. Share Jesus. Whatever way you want to use to describe the activity, what we want to see happen is men and women, boys and girls, come to a life-changing experience with the Son of God and Savior of the world. And when that happens then that's the mission of Christ. And this mission is absolute because it is directed by Jesus. 
It's directed by Jesus. Did you notice what he said in verse 8? I, I, I love this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. Notice Jesus didn't say, you might be my witnesses, you can be my witnesses, you have the option to be my witnesses. No, this is a will-be statement. Uh, now, every parent in this room, or anyone who's been a parent in this room, understands the difference between a will you will and will you. Right? Because if you say to your kids, will you, you're giving them an option to say no. But if you say to your children, you will, is there an option implied in that? No matter how much your children argue that they heard will you, uh, it's you will. And Jesus is really clear here, you will be my witnesses. This isn't really optional, it's just reality. So it's directed by Jesus. And notice that this is the last thing Jesus said before leaving the world. Okay, he's about to ascend to heaven. The disciples are there. They're asking questions about the end, you know, about the kingdom. Ah, you know. And Jesus said, don't worry about that. Here's what's important. Now think about this. When you are saying goodbye to your loved ones who are about to travel a long way away, whether it's family members that are, have been visiting and they're going home, or whether it's your kids that are packing up and going someplace, what are the last things you say to them as they get in the car? Okay, drive safe. Love you. Yeah, most, and we always usually say, call us when you get there, right? Or text us, yeah. But we say, drive safe, text us, and I love you. Why do we say I love you last? Because we want that to be remembered. It's the message that we want our loved ones to hear so that if we were to never see them again, they'd know we love them. And guess what? Jesus' last words were not, I love you. Now, he'd already told us that he loved us. He demonstrated he loved us. And this, while we were sinners, he died for us on the cross. No, his last words to us were about mission. You are going to be my witnesses. You're going to be the ones who represent me in this world. So the mission is directed by Jesus, and the mission is priority because the hope of the world is Jesus. The hope of the world is Jesus. John chapter 3. If you want to flip back a few pages, it's page 1055 in your Bibles. John chapter 3. These are the words of Jesus. I want you to hear what Jesus says about him being the hope of the world. This isn't my interpretation. This is just the words of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. You, many of you are familiar with this passage, but I, I want you to listen to it again. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of god so jesus tells us this wonderful message of hope he says hey look anyone who believes in me won't, won't perish but will have eternal life because i didn't come to condemn the world i came to save the world and if you believe in me you are not condemned now if you just pause right there, if you believe in Jesus, you are not condemned. That is an eternal statement, which means that your, your sins are forgiven. And, and when Jesus looks at you at the judgment, you're, you're innocent. Now, that's cool. That is hope. And that, and that means that we have the hope that, that fills us with the promise of eternal life and the promise of forgiveness of sins and the promise that one day we're going to live in a new creation and we're going to have new bodies. Hallelujah. And we're going to have no more pain or suffering or sorrow or death because all that's going to be done away. That's the hope Jesus is talking about. But according to Jesus, do people have hope of eternal life without him? I had like one person answer. According to Jesus' words, do people have any hope of eternal life apart from him? No, no they don't. Those are Jesus' words. That's not Chad's interpretation. You read it. If you don't believe, you're condemned already. And, and that's... That's significant because if Jesus Christ has changed your life, then you have that hope. The hope that I just talked about, of eternal life, of, of a new reality. But that also means that you know friends and family that need Jesus. 
they are hopeless without Christ. As are the 35 to 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. People who don't wake up on Sunday morning and think, I got to go to church. Or even I should go to church, but people who wake up and never think about it because God's not a part of their life. They don't identify him as significant, and they need that hope of Christ, as do the billions of people around the world, many who have never yet even heard the story one time of how Jesus loved them and gave himself up for him. Which is why we invest what we do in missions and, and why we give and why we say this city is our mission field because we want to share the hope of Christ with them. So we have this absolutely essential mission given to us by God. That, that we're to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus who is the only hope of eternal life. So let's talk about how we can do our part. How do we fulfill our purpose? How do we make this a reality of saying, hey, okay, God, you've called me to this purpose. What's my, what's my part in this? So let's talk about our strategy. Through the love of his people and the power of his truth. So you guys get the rest of our mission statement? See, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And that order is intentional. What comes first? Love. The love of his people and the power of his truth. By the way, the truth is what we just talked about. That the only hope for life is in Jesus. That he is the salvation. He is the one who offers eternal life. And that's the truth that we'll never let go of but we lead with love. At Calvary, we want to lead with love. That relationship precedes rebuke. And that's in contrast to that old school evangelism that I was talking about earlier, that some of us grew up on. The kind of evangelism that said, what you got to do is you got to go knock on doors and bother people. And you got to preach on the street corners. you got to hand out tracts all over the place. you got to go interrupt picnics and bother people and, and have confrontational discussions. you got to have a hard sell approach because you got to close the deal. I was never any good at closing the deal. It's very easy to have conversations with people about God and about faith. I don't find that difficult at all. But I, I never could close the deal. Never was good at kind of pushing people because I didn't want to push them away. And I knew that if Jesus was drawing them to himself, that they would end up loving him and knowing him. Instead, we want to begin with love. We want to begin with love because love will lead to a relationship where truth is welcomed. Because when you have a relationship with people, you've earned the right to be heard. Think about it how it is in your life, in your interactions with people. Which do you respond better? The hard sell, somebody being pushy, trying to get you to do it now? Or to somebody that you know and trust who says, hey, try this. Check it out. See what I think. So what does it look like in our lives? If we're going to fulfill this strategy, love of his people and the power of his truth, what does that look like in our lives and in the church? Let's start with the personal. Your life. We represent Jesus in our lives. Now, that doesn't sound all that dramatic, except that it really is, because the power that we have, the influence that we have, is the life that we live. The, the influence that we have, good and bad, positive and negative, is the life that we live. And, and folks, Jesus said, you're my witnesses, which means that we represent Jesus in our lives. And, and some of us are representing Jesus in a great way, a positive way. We're, we're opening the doors up and we're ushering people into the presence of Christ. And others of us are more like obstacles that are pushing people away from discovering the reality that Jesus is the hope of the world. So how are we going to represent Jesus in our lives? It's through the love of his people. The love of his people. That's us. We're his people. So do we love people? <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah. Can I qualify that? See, and see, here's where we're torn. We know the right answer is supposed to be yes. We love people. But the truth is, we love some people. <laughs> right? And there's some people that are just annoying. We don't, they, you know, we don't want to love them. And there's some people that, you know, they, they believe differently than I do. And they're not very lovely. And I don't really want to love them. And, and there's some people who are our enemies. And I definitely don't want to love them, even though Jesus told me to do it. But if we're going to represent Jesus in our lives, then we have to love 
people. Otherwise, we'll never lead them to Jesus. So here's the test. We say we want to love people, even if we don't always love people. We want to love people. So uh, the Apostle Paul defines love in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. You ought to read the whole verse. I'm just going to read the first couple of words where Paul says, love is patient and love is kind. So are you patient and kind in your driving? Are you patient and kind in the church parking lot when you're leaving after service? You know, at least I hope so. See, but the way you represent Christ in your car matters. Are you patient and kind in the doctor's office? When, you know, you're waiting for your appointment, surrounded by all those sick people. I mean, why are they out in the doctor's office anyway? Are you patient and kind in line at the grocery store when the person in front of you decides to cash an out-of-country check? Uh, or has that only happened to me? Are you patient and kind in line at the DMV? Yeah, and some of you are going, I didn't know I had to represent Christ at the DMV. Yeah, you do. <laughs> How about this? Are you patient and kind, you know, with the, the wait staff when they get your order wrong again? See? And, and while we're on the subject of, of wait staff, do you represent Jesus well in your tipping? You know, I... I, I I used to, you know, I grew up being, you know, told, you know, you tip for service. And uh, years ago, I repented of that, and now I tip for Jesus. Because why in the world would I let a couple of dollars, you know, ruin my reputation as a follower of Christ? I mean, think about that. Do you want that, you know, waiter or waitress to walk away from the table going, jerk Christians? Or do you want them to walk away going, you know, those are kind of people that I'd like to be around. And, and then after this last service, somebody uh, gave me an idea. They, they kind of said, hey, you know what? If you say you're a Christian and, and you're uh, a cheap tipper, then you're a hypocrite." <laughs> so you guys are the first ones we tried that out with. So go ahead and spread the word and look at people and go, don't be a hypocrite. Uh, represent Jesus when you're tipping. So are you patient and kind with your spouse? See, your kids are watching, your family's watching, your friends are watching. Uh, are you representing Jesus in that most important relationship? Are you patient and kind with your children? And parents with kids at home, please, please, please do not put on the, the perfect example of, you know, a loving family in public and then go home and be a tyrant. Because practiced hypocrisy will destroy their faith. Are you patient and kind with your extended family? I mean, I mean, how powerful will your testimony actually be, your influence be, if you're the one who's the reconciler and the promoter of mercy and forgiveness in your extended family? You see, we're followers of Jesus and we represent Jesus, so don't be a jerk for Jesus. He doesn't call anyone to be that. See, at Calvary, we put it this way. We can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. Love is patient. Love is kind. For you to fulfill the purpose that God has created you for on this mission, you have to represent Jesus in your life. That's where it begins. Now let's talk about the church. How are we going to fulfill this strategy? How are we going to accomplish this purpose? How are we going to impact this community with the love and truth of Jesus? Two words to define our strategy. First of all, invite. Invite. Our primary strategy for reaching the unchurched is for you to invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers to come to church with you, to come to special events, to participate in a service project, whatever it is, for you to introduce them into the family of Christ. This is you doing biblical evangelism. Now I share that with you because many of us were told that inviting isn't evangelism. I, I remember being in church and going to witnessing training and they just said inviting isn't evangelism. Evangelism is sharing the whole plan of salvation and inviting people to pray and receive Jesus. And, and I told you I wasn't any good at it even though I wanted to be. And I'm telling you that they biblically were wrong in saying that. That inviting people is biblical evangelism. And you know where I got the idea from? The Bible. Yeah. Yeah. You see, that's the problem. When you read it, you learn stuff. And, and so John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, first chapter, is the example. There's this guy named Andrew. 
And Andrew comes across Jesus, and he's like, wow, I think Jesus is the Messiah. And you know what he does? He goes to his brother, a guy named Peter, and he says, Peter, you ought to come check this out. You ought to come and see, because I think this is the Messiah. He didn't argue with him and tell him why. He just said, come and check him out. And he brought Peter to Jesus, and well, you guys know the rest of the story. Another guy in John chapter 1 named Philip. He meets Jesus, and he, the same way, he's like, wow, there's something special about Jesus. Uh, you know, and he goes to his friend Nathaniel, and Nathaniel is a skeptic. Because Philip says, hey, do you hear about this Jesus of Nazareth? I think he's the Messiah. And Nathaniel goes, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And, and Philip doesn't argue with him. He doesn't go, hey, here's from Old Testament scriptures. You know, No, he just goes, hey, dude, come check him out. See for yourself. The first two pictures of evangelism in the New Testament are of people bringing people to Jesus. And, and so we just want you to invite your friends because you're the ones with credibility. See, if, if I just showed up at their door and invited them, they don't know me. They don't care. But they know you. They love you. They trust you. They, they respect you. They hopefully have seen the life change happening in your life. And so they will listen to you. And you invite your friends and your family. And when you do that... Our commitment is to provide a quality, friendly, relevant experience for the whole family that will seek to introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. So Calvary's strategy is to invite, and our strategy is to serve. We're going to serve our community. We're going to serve the people of Havasu. We're going to partner with schools and ministries and organizations. We're going to lead projects that bless the entire community. Why do we do that? Because we want to earn the right to be heard. As a church, we want to earn the right to be heard. Again, when people experience the love of God's people, they are more willing to listen to the truth about Christ. And serving puts us shoulder to shoulder and face to face with people who don't attend any church and have no intentions of attending any church. Let me say that again. When we go out into the community and we serve and we partner up with other organizations, it puts us face to face and shoulder to shoulder with people who aren't thinking about, hey, I need to go to church. They aren't thinking about, hey, I need to go and learn more about God. They're just living their life. And suddenly you're in relationship with them. And as you build a relationship with them, then you're going to have that opportunity to invite them to come and see or have conversations about faith with them. Because one thing I have noticed you can't lead unchurched people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus if you don't know any unchurched people. And there is a whole world in, in Christendom that surrounds themselves, cocoons themselves, if you will, in, in a world just filled with Christian people. I mean, they hang out in their Christian groups, and they go to their Christian services, and they listen to Christian music, and you can watch Christian television. It's not very good, but you can watch it. You can go to Christian movies at the theater. Uh, they're getting better, but, you know, you can do all that kind of stuff, and you can be in this Christian bubble and Jesus doesn't call us to live in that. He calls us to get outside of it and to, to touch our lives with the lives of people who are far from God so that they can know the hope that is in Christ. You see, the other reason we serve is because serving creates goodwill in our community so that when you do invite your friends or your family or your neighbors to come to church with you, they might actually go, hey, I'll, I'll go to that church because you guys came and painted my kid's school. Because you guys are on Main Street at Halloween. You see, we were made for a mission. Every one of us in here, made for a mission. If we want to fulfill our purpose and increase our joy, then we have to, first of all, know personally the hope that Jesus gives. You have to have had that life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. And secondly, you got to decide that you're going to intentionally represent Jesus to a world that desperately needs to know him. This is our mission. If you choose to accept it, Jesus will change your life.